The following is a continuation of the past lives of Cynthia Henderson, where in 1983, Peter Ramster, an Australian psychotherapist, regressed Cynthia back to a past life. The following regression is of a past life as a French woman in late 18th century France. Emily de Cheville. Cynthia was regressed to a life in France where her name is Emily de Cheville. Emily was a daughter of a wealthy merchant. Her mother and father were kind to her and gave her most of the things she desired in life. She had a private tutor who taught her English. She had brothers and sisters and lived a happy life and indulged in the pleasures of wealth. Cynthia described the chateau that her family lived in, which had a porch out the front and the large, long windows on the side. It was made of stone and had a large ballroom, along with various other living rooms and servants' quarters. There was also a downstairs kitchen with a servant's entrance. She recalled a lake near the house and green lawns and beautiful trees that surrounded the property. A large estate that commanded magnificent views over Normandy. Iron torches burned outside the front of the building, with a long drive leading up from the road to the front door. She particularly remembered the towers at the side of the building, where as a child she was never allowed to climb. Her father would be angry if they tried to get into the tower, and was afraid they would fall off. The chateau was two stories high and made of cut sandstone blocks like a small castle on large grounds. There were many parties by the lake, with guests dressed in finery and minstrels playing music throughout the night. It was here that Emily spent her early years. As a young child, she would play ball games with her father, who she loved very much. He spoiled her and would spend many hours playing. However, she said her mother was very remote. Her father was not royalty, but he was very wealthy and had many contacts with nobility. His grandfather had been someone important in the French army. Her father would tell them stories where he would sit her on his knee and tell her about their ancestors. He would point to their portraits as he talked and was very proud of a portrait of his grandfather, which was at the bottom of the stairs. The frames were so big and so high that she couldn't reach them, so he would hold her up to see them. Her brother Philippe and her would run to the kitchen and steal apples when the cook wasn't looking. She remembers the parties that were held at their chateau. She remembers the cool air and the beautiful summer nights, but it got very hot in the ballroom. She could hear the music and the laughter and liked walking by the lake. Before she was old enough to attend the parties, Philippe and she would hide by the kitchen door and watch the guests arrive, and sometimes the parties were huge. The visitors would come to the chateau in big coaches, and some of them had as many as six horses. Occasionally, the guests would wear masks, and there'd be a, a lot of music, dancing and laughter, which would last until sunrise. The servants would have to work very hard with so much food piled high on silver plates. Sometimes the people wanted to eat by the lake, so the servants would have to work even harder to carry everything down there. She remembered their holiday as a child, where it was great fun packing the trunks and getting ready to go away. The coach would be loaded up, which seemed to take all day, and they would be impatient to get going. The journey seemed to be very long, and they had to stop twice to change horses. They spent a night at an inn on the way, and they arrived at a place called the Abbey of Mont Saint-Michel. The abbey seemed to stand like a giant fairy tale castle against the sky, and they visited the village at the base of the abbey. As Emily grew older, she met a man whom she eventually married. It was time to set up her own household and create a new life. Her husband was an army officer who could afford the comforts of life, though not quite to the standards of her father. She remembered a wedding which seemed very serious and everyone was solemn. She remembered feeling that the carefree life came to an end, and there were no more games or childish ways. After the wedding, she left Normandy and moved to Paris, to the home of her husband, and she never saw her mother or father again. After arriving in Paris, she had to run the house and had three servants, but they were not poor. Her children were born in the house, and it was there that she lived for the rest of that life. She lived comfortably with her husband and children. Suddenly, the atmosphere of Paris became worse as the years passed, where food became scarce and the people were starving. 
The unrest spread and life became progressively dangerous. The wealthy lived in style and the poor starved. A son was called Edward and a daughter Marianne. Edward was dark like his father, whereas Marianne was blonde with curls. When they were about 15 and 16, they were sent away to Normandy to live with her father. She would have liked to have left Paris herself. Her husband told her to stay indoors, and in the end, she didn't leave the house very much. When she did, she had to be very careful. Peter Ramsay then asked Cynthia to describe what she saw in the streets of Paris. She said, filthy people in rags who stank and there were many rats. The streets are narrow and the houses are small and very close together. The streets have rough stones and there are lots of drinking houses, bakeries, fish cellars. The rats are there because of the dirt and they run amongst their feet. You have to be careful with the babies, they bite them. It's getting so bad she won't walk the streets anymore. The crowds are abusive sometimes if they think you have food. She said that life in Paris slowly became worse until finally the peasants revolted and the revolution began. She remembered being dragged from her home by the mob and put into a cell. The cell is dark with one window with bars. She is standing there alone and then two men and a woman come into the cell and push her down onto her knees. The men hold her hair while they cut her hair with a knife but only at the back and is frightened and almost fainting. They drag her out to where she is then pushed the front of a cart, while others are pushed in behind her, but she doesn't look at them. She's numb with fear and everything is unreal and she doesn't feel anything. The cart bumps along the cobblestone streets where the crowd is shouting and abusing, spitting, swearing and hissing. When the cart reaches the guillotine, they are dragged off to wait in the line. There's an official with a pen and a scroll at the bottom of the steps who asks the name of each person. After the deals are taken, they go up the steps of the guillotine, where there are four men and a priest, and then executed. They don't leave much time between each one. As soon as one is beheaded, the mob cries for the next. Every time the blade comes down, the mob goes wild, cheering, shouting and clapping. The guillotine is on a pedestal made of wood with a frame around, where they've hung red, white and blue drapes. The guillotine is very high and underneath, at the front, is a basket for the heads. The other men on the platform are waiting to take the bodies. Around the square are buildings with people on the balconies and at the windows. Every available space to watch is full. There is a tall man who stands there inciting the people who cry out and shout. When one card is emptied, they bring the next. Blood is in the streets. They're standing in blood. It's running in rivers. Some of the heads are placed on poles and carried around the streets. She's the only woman amongst eight men, and the men go first. She's the last and has to wait and watch. She's full of terror, and then it's her turn. They ask her name, but she cannot speak, so she's told to go forward up the steps. She's cold and trembling, and wants to get it over quickly. They push her from behind while the mob is shouting. At the top of the steps, the executioner is there waiting. She is then pushed forward and the blade is raised. The steps are steep and she has to be pushed and pulled up to them. She says, wants the nightmare over. They push her towards the guillotine and she falls down. Her hands are tied behind her as she falls down onto her knees and her neck hits the wood and almost chokes her. She is now on the guillotine. The guillotine drops down where it seems an eternity to be staring at the basket, just staring. She hears the mob and the blade dropping, and then suddenly, she's not in her body. She sees her head roll into the basket, and the eyes are open. The bodies are taken and thrown over a wall and left to rot. Then she has a feeling as if she's floating into a white mist. So peaceful. The sound of the terrible crowd just faded away. There was someone there waiting for her, someone to meet her, and she followed. They led her through a tunnel with beautiful music. They said that it's all over now, you're with us now. So ended Cynthia's recollection of life in France, full of happiness, gaiety, wealth, and finally horror. Looking back, Cynthia saw it as a frivolous, happy life, but one that was shallow and lacking in depth and meaning. The death was memorable only because of the fear, the blood, and the hate of the crowd. 
Today, Cynthia has a red mark across the back of her neck, like a birthmark. Next week, Peter Ramster and Cynthia visit France, where she recognises the Chateau and other landmarks from a life as Amélie de Chateau.